195 Silent Light. I think you should stand. It's just hard for me to watch you sit and sing. you that we're going Christmas caroling on the 21st. If you'd like to go, see me. Gentlemen. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this evening. Thank you for all the people that came out to hear Pastor Tom preach the good news of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. I want to thank you, Lord, for the message that we heard this morning. It's how just a wonderful event that happens in our life when we humble ourselves, knowing that we are sinners, that we confess our sins, and our Lord's precious blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary and washed our sins away, and we receive that wonderful gift of eternal life be forever with our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you for that privilege. And Lord, just guide and direct us this evening. And tomorrow, just pray that we start our day off reading scripture, having prayer, just having our Lord first in our everyday life. We give you all the praise for that privilege. Thank you, Lord, for this time as we take up the offering to meet the needs of our church. Thank you for that. Amen. Mm -hmm.
Thank you, ladies. Beautiful song. We love that one. Let's pray together. Oh, God, what a great night you've blessed us with. What a privilege it is for us to be together in this place. We have come in Jesus' name, and we've come to worship him, the one true God and the Savior of the world. And uh, we love, as we so often know, the testimonies of your people. They, uh, such testimonies prompt us to think about Christ and the way that he ministers not only to other people, but to us personally, intimately. We, through our testimonies, rehearse so many realities, so many truths in regard to our great God and Savior, and for that we're thankful too. And of course, we love our, our communion Sunday evenings and the reminders inherent in that. I, all of it just uh, paves the way beautifully for us to spend a few moments in the word of God, and here we are, we're ready to look to you, God, for your help as we uh, consider your word. So that's our prayer. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, it's good to be back with our study in Second Thessalonians tonight. I remind you that when last we were engaged with the study, we were hovering over the phrase chosen to salvation, uh, found in verse 13 of uh, Second. Thessalonians chapter 2, if you'd find the verse, please, I'd like to read it to you and with you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. If you've been with us, well, first of all, I want to say to you that we have uh, some unfinished business here, and I trust that we can be efficient so that we complete our thoughts tonight in regard to this. If you've been with us, you know that we have been obviously seeking understanding in regard to this particular verse, and specifically uh, this phrase, chosen to salvation, we have asked and been in the process of answering what does Paul mean when he says to the Thessalonians and also to the Calvary Baptistonians, <laughs> you have been chosen to salvation. Uh, we, we don't want to get sidetracked, and of course this isn't a sidetrack or a rabbit trail, but we noted that the hyper-Calvinistic Reformed theologian actually uses 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 as a proof text, and so you and I have got to have a good understanding of this verse, the Reformed theologian actually uses 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 as a proof text for his belief that God has chosen some to salvation, that is the few, the elect, while at the same time choosing most, that is the many, the non-elect, to condemnation, and that nothing can be done about it, neither one can do anything about it. I just pause very quickly to note with you, talk about putting, talk about both putting words in God's mouth and also taking words out of God's mouth. And we need to be very, very careful about that. You know that that's very dangerous. What we've been doing right from the get-go is emphasizing the importance of context, and you're not unfamiliar with that because you guys are good hermeneutics. Ones. Context, context, context. To understand what God has said and what he means in any given place, and certainly here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, and more specifically this phrase chosen to salvation, of course you need to consider the context. We started out in the most broad way. Again, we're talking about context within the confines of Scripture, we start out with the most um, broadest context, and that is that we have been um, noting and will continue to note that God desires for all to be saved. We could actually look at this phrase, chosen to salvation, and give a biblical case for 
the fact that God has chosen everyone for salvation. And that is reflecting on what we know to be true of the heart of God, that he desires for all men, every man, woman, and young person, to know him, to have a personal and intimate relationship with him. Actually, believe it or not, i got to be careful about doing this, but it goes all the way back to the very beginning of the book of beginnings, Genesis, and the garden, and Adam and Eve, and we, we really see the heart of God starting there, and it never changes as we follow the, through the pages of scripture and so we have um, Peter proclaiming as you so well know that God desires for all to be saved he's not willing that any should um, perish but that all should come to to repentance the word of God couldn't be any more clear than what it is in regard to the heart of God but we noted together and this is a very significant observation although again marked by simplicity that God not only desires for every man, woman, and young person to be saved, but he has absolutely paved the way for every man, woman, and young person to be saved. And yet in the same breath we say we are not universalists. We do not believe that every man, woman, and young person is going to be saved. The reality is that most will not. But the biblical point is God desires for all men to be saved, every man, woman, and young person. And you can count on this, that he has paved the way for every man, woman, and young person to be saved. All of God's people said to that, that's the God that we worship and serve. And so that's the most broad context. And then we got a little bit narrower and we... Um, noted that when we come across such terminology like chosen to, and fr phraseology like chosen to salvation, and even some of those other scarier words like predestination and election, that almost always when you find those terms, that God is anticipating that you're going to see that within the context of the big picture of salvation. That God isn't interested only in saving us. Praise, the God, praise God that he wants to save us and he's paved the way for that. But that isn't the end. It's the beginning of a great adventure. And the plan of God in regard to salvation is so very big. And so you move from justification, which we usually think of, to sanctification and all the way to glorification. And often, and I've been reminded of this in my Sunday school class, that when God uses some of these terms that, you, you know, that we, um, uh, th that we um, have arrived at a place where we view as being a little bit scary, a lot of times he's, he's talking about not that point in time when you put your faith and trust in Christ, but rather God's grand and glorious and big plan for your life that moves you, again, all the way to glorification, and we'll see that in just a second here in our text. And, and you've got to lo love that. In fact, be, before I forget that, let me go ahead and show you. Isn't it interesting? We've read verse 13. I'm rereading, but we're going to pick up verse 14 as well. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. We're coming back to that in just a second. But notice verse 14, unto which he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory. There's your glorification. God isn't interested just in saving you. He's very interested in your sanctification presently, and he's very interested, yea, has promised your glorification. And even though we have the privilege of cooperating with God in regard to all of these things, the fact of the matter is if you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are absolutely going to be glorified. Why? Because it's part of the promised plan of God. Can't talk about salvation without talking about sanctification, and you can't talk about sanctification without also talking about glorification. And most of the time when we find in the word of God these words like chosen and elect and predestined, the, God is prompting us to look at the bigness of the plan, and that's very, very helpful to us. Now, most narrowly, and wow, you guys are doing good, and thank you, God. In fact, I, I better slow down a little bit. Hmm. Very, very exciting. I, I, let me just say this to you. When, when you put 
when, when you put your faith and trust in Christ, I guess we've already noted this, so it's a reiteration. When, w yes, it is a reiteration. When you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he absolutely instantaneously tr transformed your life. Now, we know that there's a progression to the transformation, but, and we're reveling in this again this morning. I guess every time we get together, we revel in such things that, that when we put our faith and trust in Christ, he transforms our lives. He not only forgives our sins, but he makes us a part of his family. And every time we think about being a part of his family, we in turn inherent in that is the prospect, the great hope, the certain expectation that we're heading home that we're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the great things that comforts you all in regard to the significant losses of your earthly sojourn is the recognition that it's just a little while and we're going to see him again just a little bit. Wait, and, and we can use Christ's words. Don't you love it? Just a little while, he says. Wait just a little while. Be encouraged by that. And, and again, see, doesn't this reflect again on the big picture of salvation? Wow. Just embrace the big picture of salvation and know what God has done, what he is doing, and what he's pledged himself to, to do all of that. Very, very exciting. But having said all of that then, and now we're, we're emphasizing context from the most broadest to the most narrow, this is very, very interesting to me. And I don't fully understand how the hyper-Calvinistic Reformed theologian can look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 and use it as a proof text for his TULIP class, the five pillars upon which hyper-Calvinistic hyper teaching is built, when Paul actually not only talks about the big picture of our salvation, but he does indeed frame his words. He's doing so under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit of God so that we are prompted in the most narrow way to even look at that point in time when we trusted Christ and the mechanics of what was unfolding in regard to that. Did you catch it? I'm reading verse 13 one more time. Uh, and I, I got to get back quick, sorry. I, I was fidgeting up, up here. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brother and beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. There's that big picture, but hey, wait a minute. Paul actually gives us the little picture again, an emphasis on that point in time when we put our faith and trust in Christ, and he gives us the mechanics. Did you catch it? Chosen you to salvation via Dia, here's the means, through sanctification of the Spirit, and did you catch this? And belief of the truth. Again, I can just leave that with you, because you guys are so good, but I, I, I will think it through with you for just a few moments. Think about that point in time when you trusted Christ, and I'm, I'm reiterating something too, and I have often said this through the course of my ministry. I initially was saying it even to myself. When we talk about that point in time when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the fact of the matter is there are many of God's people that have trouble looking back and putting their finger on a point in time. That doesn't dismiss the fact that we arrive at the place in our lives where we are indeed putting our faith and trust in Christ and God is indeed doing what he promised to do in that he saves us and he saves us good. But I've often said first to myself and then by way of counsel to other people in regard to that, if you have trouble putting your finger on a time when you put your faith and trust in Christ, then just make a marker now. If you are disconcerted, if you are wondering about whether or not you actually have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and if part of the disconsternation is because, uh, because you're having trouble putting your finger on it, then make a marker. Um, when God saves, it's through and through. When God saves, it's a one-time event, again, but unfolds, and you know all of that very well. But we are indeed saved at point in time. 
the Apostle Paul gives us the mechanics of our salvation. It's twofold. He first of all says that we are saved through the sanctification of the Spirit. This is God's part, obviously. You can't be saved. I, I'm not telling you anything new. You can't be saved apart from God miraculously working in your life. You can't be saved apart from the wooing of the Holy Spirit of God. But the question actually becomes, who does the Spirit of God woo? And the biblical answer is everyone. I love John 1, 9. I've often cited it with you. It says that Christ, when he comes into the world, lights every single man. It's a neat verse. It's just before some classic verses, and so I think we kind of read over it, but it's a, it's a valuable part of your apologetic. In, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Christ said, I am the light of the elect only. And in John 16, 8, Christ had his pneumatology mixed up when he said of the Holy Spirit that he would come and reprove the elect of sin. And of course, sadness all around in your misunderstanding of John 3.16, for God to love the world of the elect. Again, could God be any more clear? He desires everybody to be saved, and he's paved the way for everybody to be saved, and yet again, from a realistic standpoint, not everybody will, but we're back to recognizing that ultimately, because God woos everyone, and because he threw his... Through the, um, through the universal, efficacious sacrifice on Calvary's cross for the sins of the world. He has paved the way for every man to be saved, and so in light of that, it ultimately does come down to whether, man, whether or not man believes. And isn't it interesting that Paul captures that? It's the second part of the mechanic. First of all, we are saved via, through, the sanctification of the Spirit, through the wooing of the Spirit of God. And I would make a case, I believe I have, that God woos everyone. And two, saved through the belief of the truth. That's man's part. The first part is God's part. Saved through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit of God. That's God's part. But the believing is yours. And you're not foolish enough to believe that believing is a work. You're not foolish enough to believe that, that's some, that, that when you assent, that that's a work. You're not foolish enough to believe that you somehow have earned your salvation because you've received the gift. No. And so we don't have to worry about this somehow being a work of man, because the reason why we're emphasizing that, of course, is because we, we know that you can't be saved by your works. We know that we are saved only, purely through the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, it does come down to a decision that we make. You've got to believe. And I think that you have. And we are glad you've been chosen to salvation you've been chosen to salvation in that God desires for none to, be, none to perish for all to come to repentance and that God not only desires for everyone to repent but that he has effectively through the sacrifice of, Calvary, uh, of Christ on Calvary's cross he's paved the way for every man woman to be, uh, and, and child to be saved so everyone has been chosen to salvation in regard to that. But you've also been chosen to salvation, those of you that have put your faith and trust in Christ, and that most of the time when we find these terms, and even the word salvation, that God is talking a lot more than just the point in time when you put your faith and trust in Christ. He almost always is talking about the big picture, and so we with joy move from justification, the great doctrine of justification, to the great doctrine of sanctification to the great doctrine of glorification. 
And then you, those of you who have put faith and trust in Christ, you've been chosen to salvation by the means of the Holy Spirit of God and your simple belief. We rejoice again tonight in our salvation and the fact that it is potentially available to, and it, not potentially, it is available to and, and potentially effective with every man, woman, and child. So keep testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel at every turn. Let's pray together. God, thank you. We're so glad that we had the privilege of hovering over this phrase. We've been at it for a couple of sessions, and and uh, it's been valuable to us in regard to our apologetic. And again, I thank you for that. We're leaving tonight reveling in our salvation, so rich and free in Christ and Christ alone. And we're leaving tonight reveling in the fact that you desire for every man, woman, and child to be saved. We leave rejoicing in the fact that you have effectively paved the way for every man, woman, and child to be saved. But it ultimately is hinged on they're saying yea or nay to Christ. So continue to work, continue to use us in your work. We pray for Jesus' sake, amen. <laughs>in heaven thank you so much that Jesus Christ was slain for a world of lost sinners the whole world including us that we were lost without you Lord and yet you shined your light on us you opened our hearts to your to your word your gospel your spirit and we accepted you through faith in Jesus Christ thank you Lord help us to tell others about that cross that we cherish, about the sacrifice and the Savior who died for us and rose again. Help us tell others that this Christmas time is a season that many are searching. Lord, we just pray that you'd use us for your name's sake. We pray that you bless the business meeting now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.